Uh, but my name's Ethan Stokes. I'm an engineering technologist working on PowerStore. And what I've got now is uh, a couple of quick demonstrations for you. Uh, so I'll be covering PowerStore clusters. Specifically, we'll go through add appliance. And then I'll also showcase the native import feature on PowerStore. So I've got a quick slide. Uh, quick in this. I've got a quick slide to refresh uh, what a PowerStore cluster is, what it looks like. Avishek touched on this in a couple of the earlier presentations. And then we'll go right into that add appliance demonstration. And then I've got a quick slide to touch up on the PowerStore native import. And then I'll go through the demonstration for that. So for a PowerStore cluster, uh, you can start with a single PowerStore appliance. So you can see that there on the screen. It's the two node, two you appliance. And it comes with uh, up to uh, 25 drives in the base enclosure. The first thing that you can do with a cluster, which is nice, as you can see there at the bottom, is you can independently scale the compute and the storage for your PowerStore cluster. So what do we mean by that? So a single appliance, you can scale up the capacity by adding additional expansion enclosures. So you can add uh, up to three more expansion enclosures, and these are 2U25 drive bays. In addition to scaling up the storage, you can scale out the appliance, uh, scale out the cluster. So this is something that's been brought up multiple times today. You can add up to a total of four appliances within your PowerStore cluster. And with the release of 2.0, which came out in June, this is supported on both PowerStore T and PowerStore X uh, model lines. So one thing that's really nice here with PowerStore clustering is that you can have different configurations of your appliances uh, that you add within the same cluster. So that gives you some of the flexibility when you scale this out, whether you would want to add a mirror appliance of exactly what you had originally, or if you'd add a slightly different configuration based on the new requirements, whether that's a higher model, a lower model, different drive configurations, there's a lot of flexibility there. So this is a quick recap of what PowerStore clustering is. Now I'm gonna jump into a demonstration and we'll actually see what it looks like to take a PowerStore appliance and then add another appliance to it. And we'll show you how easy that is and what that looks like. Uh, so let me switch over real quick. So this is the dashboard view for the PowerStore manager. And if I navigate to the hardware tab, you can see that right now it's a single appliance PowerStore 1000X in this cluster. And what we're going to do is go ahead and add an additional appliance to it. So from this dashboard page, if you look at the specific cluster, we can see that it's pretty heavily utilized. We've got about 80% utilized. And we're gonna take a look at uh, what that looks like after we add another appliance. Here on the host page, we can see the two default PowerStore X uh, ESXi hosts, which are added right here, those are native. And then I've also added a Windows host uh, to this system. And then if we go over to volumes, you can see that there's a single volume that's been provisioned to that Windows host. So there is a workload running in the background uh, during this add appliance demo. So to add the appliance, you navigate to the hardware page and then click on the add button. And what this will do is this is going to go and discover all of the unconfigured appliances on your network. So this is a lab network, so it returns a number of different systems, and we can see them listed here. And I'm gonna go ahead and select that PowerStore 1000X in the middle. So you select the appliance that you wanna add and then click next, and it's gonna load the drive failure tolerance page. So this is another new feature that was added in 2.0, got touched on earlier. And you've got the option to select either single drive or double drive failure. For this, we'll go ahead and keep the default as single drive and click next. Now, these three sections of the wizard, what we'll be doing are adding in the additional IPs that are necessary for this new appliance. So with a PowerStore X, uh, there's three different networks in play, a management network, storage network, and vMotion network. So the wizard here is going to prompt me for the amount of IPs that I need to add, and then I'll go in and add them. You can see they show up as unused there. And then once we go and kick off this add appliance operation, those IPs will all be assigned. So while you can add them in the wizard, you could actually add these IPs at an earlier time. So as early as the initial configuration of the first appliance, if you have a chunk of IPs that you know you want to allocate to PowerStore, you could add all of those IPs in 
And then down the road, when you go to add additional appliances, it will pull those extra IPs and assign them. So you would be able to skip right through this. Uh, for this demonstration, I went and added them in line uh, as I was prompted. So all the IPs are added. I can go ahead and validate. And the power store is going to run some checks here against the environment, and against the information you added to ensure uh, that everything looks good. So this is a, a known issue um, that I expected to see, which is fine. In our environment, we have jumbo frames enabled on these switches, uh, but these specific lab systems are configured with a default 1500 MTU. Uh, so that won't prove an issue for us. So you'll go ahead and add the appliance and you can see it kicks off that job and you can select the job to actually monitor it. Uh, but one thing that's nice here is this job's running kind of asynchronously to the power store manager interface, right? So I can continue to move around in the interface. I can go to the dashboard. I can look at my workload, see everything continues to run. So you don't have to sit there and wait for the appliance to add. Since this is a demo, I'm gonna fast forward a bit. It takes about 15 minutes to add a PowerStore X appliance. And here we can see now we've got two appliances. And then if you jump back to the dashboard page, so if I pause real quick, this dashboard page is looking at the cluster as a whole, right? Not, not individual appliances. That's one of the advantages of the PowerStore cluster, right? Is you can manage and monitor everything in the cluster. So you can see here, the capacity for the cluster has increased greatly now that we've added this second appliance. So you can see the utilization has dropped down because we've added a, a large chunk of storage with this new appliance. You can see here in the chart on the right, that this new appliance had a lot more capacity than the, uh, the original appliance. All right, so I'll keep moving. So that's a look at the add appliance and what that looks like and how easy it is to do. Oh, one thing I do want to reiterate, uh, so this was brought up earlier, but there's a lot of intelligence. I've only got so much time to show you what PowerStore can do, uh, but there's a lot of intelligence that's built into a multi-appliance cluster. And so now that you've got a multi-appliance cluster, things like uh, intelligent initial volume placement, where the PowerStore cluster will select the best possible appliance to uh, create the volume on when a user goes in and creates it instead of having to have them manually select the appliance, as well as the assisted migration, where PowerStore will continually monitor the usage of all the appliances. And if an appliance is approaching a time when it will run out of space, it will proactively generate an alert and then also select resources to move off of that overutilized appliance onto other appliances in the cluster, which have more capacity. So there's a lot of intelligence there. I'm gonna go forward now. And let's take a look at the second half of this demonstration, which is going through the PowerStore native import. So PowerStore native import allows the user to import block data uh, from source systems directly into PowerStore and hence the name native. Uh, it's done natively within PowerStore. There's no additional tools or applications uh, that the user would need uh, to get this done. So you can see listed there, there's the five source systems which are supported. And that's Extreme IO, Unity, and then SC Series, VNX Series, and PS Series. So I'm going to quickly jump into the demonstration and we'll go through what it looks like to actually import storage into your PowerStore cluster. All right. So here we've got another PowerStore cluster. If I go to the hardware tab, this specific cluster. Uh, is a PowerStore X cluster. You can see the, the PowerStore 1000X model there. And if I go over to the volumes page, there's no volumes on this appliance right now. I'm gonna jump to a Unity system, which will be our source system. You can see the demo Windows volume there. That is the volume that we'll go ahead and import. And if I click on the volume and navigate to host access, it is being accessed by a Windows server. So I've got a Windows server connected over iSCSI. That's accessing the volume on Unity. We jump to Windows. You can see there is our demo Windows volume. I've created a file on that volume. And we're also running a workload against it using PDBench. So we'll look and see you know, how the workload looks um, and, and when it's running throughout the process of this workload, or of this import, excuse me. So to get it started, we'll navigate to the migration tab. And then this is where you can go and add your remote system. So you can have up to six different remote systems added. Go click the add remote system button. 
and here are the five different supported systems. We'll select Unity. You then input the management IP address of the Unity system, and then you input the iSCSI IP address. So the data flow for this import from the source system to PowerStore is going through iSCSI. So that's why we look for the uh, iSCSI IP there. I'll put in the Unity credentials, and then go ahead and confirm the certificate. And now the PowerStore system will ensure the compatibility of the system. Uh, there are certain code versions, so there's minimum code versions required on the source system, as there is a lot of integration between PowerStore and the source system. So now that it's added, I can go and fetch the volumes. This will index the Unity system and pull back all the volumes uh, that can be imported. The next step is to add that Windows Server to PowerStore. So you see the two default hosts that come with a PowerStore X appliance. I'll go ahead and click Add Host to add in this new Windows Server. I'll give it a name and then select Windows as the operating system. Click Next. And then this is uh, going to be an iSCSI Windows Server. So here I select the global discovery IP address on PowerStore. And then using that, I will establish an iSCSI connection of the Windows Server. So you can see it's connected to Unity right now, uh, each of the, the Unity SPs. And then I'll put in that global discovery IP and connect to both of the PowerStore nodes. So you can see it's got connections to both systems now. And I'll jump back to PowerStore and click Next. And PowerStore automatically discovers that Windows uh, initiator that logged in. I'll associate that with this host object, and then we'll finish creating the host. So we've added in the remote system. We've added in our host that we want. Now let's go and actually begin migrating the data. So select the Unity system and click Import Storage. And this is an overview showing you the two different types of imports we support, a non-disruptive import and then an agentless import. So in this demonstration, we'll be going through the agentless version. These are all the volumes that were returned. Um, we can see that the top three are eligible. You can see our demo Windows volume there. The other two volumes are actually replication destinations on Unity, replicating with another Unity. So you can import a destination volume. You could add this into a volume group on PowerStore once the import completes. We'll skip that for now. This is when you'd select the host, whether you're selecting the agentless host um, or the agent host for the non-disruptive import. Since we're doing agentless, we're going to select that Windows host that we just added. Now we're associating the host we want with the volume we're bringing in. We can set a schedule to either begin immediately or select a certain date and time. And you could also check the box for an automatic cutover. Um, that would essentially complete the session automatically. I'm gonna do that unchecked to show you all the steps. Finally, you can assign a protection policy which takes effect once the import completes. So that would be your snapshots and or your replication, uh, what Marco and Chuck were talking. So this is a summary page and we'll go ahead and kick that off. So you can see that creates the import session there. Uh, there's a lot of different information that's shown on this page. You can see a lot of different columns uh, and there's even more um, if you expand the, the column option button. Uh, there's a lot of information that you can get right from uh, this import page. So what I'll do here is go ahead and refresh the table. And I can see that the import state is in a ready to enable destination volume. So the way this uh, agentless import works is we're actually going to cut over and access it from the power source side at the beginning. So what it's saying here um, is that you need to go and uh, take the volume offline on the host. Um, this is the minimally disruptive part as the connection is redirected from the Unity to power store. So here, here I am on that Windows host. I'll go and stop that workload and offline the volume. And then go back to PowerStore. I confirm uh, that I've taken the volume offline. And now we're enabling the volume on PowerStore. So previously, everything was on Unity. Now we enable it on PowerStore. Now that that's completed, it's ready to start the copy. It's a very quick uh, transition. And then now you go ahead and bring the volume back online. So the actual copying part, the import part, 
of this uh, migration is all online with data access. It's only right in the beginning that there's a minimally disrupted part. So I bring the volume back online. And I'm going to go ahead and kick off this VD bench workload again. So this workload is now running against PowerStore. Any data that has not been brought over yet that would be accessed by the host, PowerStore will go and pull that data from the Unity system. So that connection is established there. During this copy, any new data written is written to both PowerStore and the Unity system um, or the source system if you have a different uh, source system. And that ensures that you can roll back at any time. So now we're in a ready to cut over state. I'm going to go ahead and cut over the import. And this essentially finalizes the import. So at this time, once you do this, you can no longer roll it back. It's no longer going to be copying the rights to the Unity system or the source system. So if I jump back to the workload, you can see that it's continued to run through that whole import process. I'll go ahead and cut over the session. And then once this finishes, you'll see that the import has completed. The import state has changed. And then I'll navigate to the volumes page. You can see that our new demo Windows volume exists here and has been brought over from the Unity system. So why would you do this on a running application? I can understand if moving um, the application from one system to another, but I don't understand why you'd want to do it on a running application. What would be the use case? Yeah, so it depends on the requirements of the application, um, but depending on the, you know, if you need to maintain uptime for the storage that that application is accessing, but you need to move it off an older source array, you're refreshing your storage environment, you would need a way to move that data from the old system to the power store while allowing the application to continue to access it. If you don't have the ability to bring it down for that time. Oh, and, and I'll add that <clears throat> there is a completely non-disruptive option as well. As well, yes. so uh, Ethan talked about it as one of the two options. He chose the agentless version, but you could do the completely non-disruptive version as well. <clears throat> yep. And then the final part of the demo here is if I go to Unity, you can see. Let me jump that back just a second. You can see that PowerStore has automatically gone in and remove that host access. So there's a lot of integration between PowerStore uh, and the, the source system. There's a lot of communication going on and it's automatically preserved the volume. So it doesn't delete it. So it is still here if something happens, if you need it, um, but it has removed the host access. So there's no conflicts there. And then the end of this is that uh, you can see the workload continues to run um, now that we've finished the, uh, the import and it's on PowerStore. 